Thank you very much. And thank you to Austin Water for hosting. This has been, this already exceeded my expectations, the program this morning. So I've been really excited to um, see these presentations and I hope you all appreciate the information in them. Um, lots of great experience um, and I'll try to touch on some of the, the commonalities and common points here. Um, my background is in wastewater engineering, so that's um, sort of the lens I'll speak to you today. I will try not to get too jargony or talk in too much technical detail. Um, the focus here is um, a, a bit of a national perspective, but also an owner's perspective, right? So you all are trying to develop properties, develop buildings, and you want to understand how water might impact that development, and particularly this um, sort of newish concept, at least in these um, urban contexts for on-site water reuse. Um, so I'll get a bit into the business case for that as well. Um, so food for thought, just some, some, some thoughts to ponder as I go through the presentation. Um, On-site non water systems can be a transformative opportunity. I'm so excited to see it in Austin's Water Forward program. I've been uh, lucky to participate um, over my last four years at Sherwood in the very closely in San Francisco's non potable ordinance. Was actually involved in some research that I'll show you at the end that went into some of the um, the risk-based framework that you've heard talked about today and before the non-potable ordinance became mandatory in San Francisco, um, that framework is now uh, code required. It's now going to be kind of code in the state of California, um, so really taking off. Um, but there are some risks that benefits might not be realized, so I want um, us to sort of ponder about what are, the, what are the important things we need to think about so that we don't have um, you know, mothball rainwater harvesting systems so that we don't have O&M systems, operators shutting off systems just in having to reclaim and fill the tank, right? We want these things to be successful and we want to do it right. Um, so we consider all the driving forces because a one-size-fits-all approach does not work, right? Specifying the equipment is like the last step, right? We're, a lot of things to think about before you pick out um, uh, what you're going to what you're gonna put on your site. And I will argue that changes to market uh, demands are driving <coughs> developers themselves towards this, uh, away from business as usual thinking. Um, so uh, we'll, get, we'll get into that a little bit today. It's a little hard to read, um, but I'd like to point out a few resources that are available to you. And um, you know, sometimes I think it's not the case here. We, um, so it's hosted by Austin Water. But sometimes utilities get a little bit nervous about these systems, and so. Um, the U.S. Water Alliance has put together a document talking about the utility case and argues that um, not only will on-site non potable water systems, uh, the acronym ONWS, help you comply with regulations, but also realize um, sort of triple bottom line benefits here. So there are mutually beneficial outcomes for both developers and utilities. Um, developers uh, from an insulating from market volatility, so looking at water rates. Um, there are return on investments, potential to reduce connection fees. That's something that's very much sort of negotiated and is specific to your site, so I'll get into that a little bit. Um, increase allowable density, floor area ratio. So sometimes water is a limiting factor, and I was hearing that this morning with some of the opening remarks. Um, so we'll talk about uh, that a little bit. Um, and demystifying the entitlements process for water. So sometimes uh, early on in development, it makes sense to start thinking about these systems early on and understand your permitting process. So uh, one of the lessons learned from the previous project, engage TCEQ early and often, right? So um, getting that, that team together early, including the regulators. And, and then all of these benefits that can be realized from the utilities whose uh, mandate is to provide reliable sources of, of water for various purposes. And so um, these systems are, are additive. They're in a way redundant to the existing infrastructure and provide flexibility and resilience to that infrastructure. Um, can be seen as a second line of defense and you contribute to it, um, diversifying water supply, localizing water supply, a really important theme right now in our industry. And it can help to meet wastewater treatment needs. In some cases, we have treatment plants that were built in the late 70s, 80s, when the Clean Water Act um, um, compliance was starting to be implemented. Uh, those plants are reaching end of useful life, a lot of upgrades needed, a lot of constraints on space, development encroachment around those plants. Um, so, so meeting wastewater treatment um, uh, demand requirements or, or capacity requirements um, can be a really big driver for some utilities. Um, and then the potential to defer those capital intensive projects. So all these upgrades I mentioned um, are, are, are hitting home and we're starting to see water and sewer rates really skyrocket nationwide. Um, <clears throat> so something to think about, I'd like to point out uh, the book by David said, like a professor out of Berkeley, Water 4.0, it's a great book written in layman's terms and it's about this sort of fourth water revolution we're going through right now. So I don't want to you know, underestimate the, um, 
So sort of the, the change that's that we're undergoing in our water infrastructure. And I, um, I didn't have the book with me last night, but I wanted to pull it close. So this, this Amazon reviewer said it all for me. Um, <laughs> and again, just pointing out the sort of triple bottom line benefits here. Um, so project delivery consideration will be my first topic. Um, I'll, again, uh, as promised, try not to spend too long on the technical jargon, but I'll go quickly through a water balance and water characterization. Um, and um, then we'll spend some time on the uh, business case studies. Um, I'll go through a few uh, recent design solutions. There's been some great uh, presentations today on um, implementation, so I'm not going to speak too much to the actual sort of implementation of projects. I'll be more at the higher level, planning level, but happy to answer questions on that end. And um, some, some closing remarks. <laughs> So um, it might be hard to read, but, but this is just to say, um, you know, here's four examples of a system. I mentioned that not all systems are, not, there's no one size fits all solution. So if you had a residential building, um, you know, maybe you want to consider a gray water system because there's so much of it, right? From showers and sinks and laundry washing. Um, so it might be worth sort of separating it out as costs a bit more to install that dual drain plumbing system. Um, but then you have um, some, some Sort of water that's a little bit easier to treat, and you can send that to landscape. Maybe that's a good fit for your site. You have a commercial building. Maybe you have um, rainwater and stormwater that um, you, you know, need to comply with some stormwater regulations, water quality regulations, and um, a great way to do that is to also have a reuse system for meeting cooling tower makeup. Um, maybe you have a, a sort of site-based system where you want to just um, take your gray water and your black water, combine it as wastewater and um, treat that for the, sort of the, the, the big three, irrigation, toilet flush, and cooling, which um, often are the three uh, uses that we're looking to offset. And then we look at like a district scale. So with here we're showing the sewer mining approach. Maybe you have, um, it's hard to separate building by building. It's expensive for that collection system to be separated building by building, or you have an existing sanitary sewer. Um, sewer mining is a great opportunity, great option. You wanna work very closely with the folks uh, receiving the water downstream uh, so you don't have issues with that collection system um, and then here we're showing maybe there's an ag use maybe there's a golf course use so um, a lot of options um, I can't um, um, or I'd like to I guess just touch on location and scale they are very important for choosing your system so if you have a site that say is very far away from the existing wastewater treatment plant there isn't any municipal reclaimed water and it would be very expensive to send it all the way to that plant and send it all the way back. That's a great site for on-site reuse. Um, uh, and then scale is also very important. So when you get to a certain flow, it starts to um, sort of have more economies of scale in terms of the size of the system. So um, uh, very important. And uh, you can see some of the energy trade-offs there for a centralized versus on-site system. And I'll just point out, I, I like to use this terminology, you know, maybe not quite standardized in the, in the industry, but in urban systems, I like to call them satellites, right? They're, they're, they're very connected, whereas a more remote system where a lot of the, I would say the technical knowledge of our field is sort of built in these remote systems um, that are not very connected, and I like to call those decentralized. So, um, but it, water infrastructure is spatially sensitive, uh, more so than, say, energy, which um, isn't as physical, let's say, as water. So, um, some comparisons there. And this is just a diagram showing you some of the ways in which um, reuse can uh, can take place from a location and scale standpoint. And then ownership typology. So um, you, know, you really want to set yourself up for success when it comes to project delivery. Um, and think about what level of sort of risk and responsibility you want to take on as an owner. And so it's a sort of owner risk wheel <laughs> developed here is looking at, you know, does the conventional delivery design bid build? Um, we've heard a lot today about design build or even um, like uh, um, installation uh, and design or, or redesign happening during the installation process. So um, design bid build, excuse me, bid build does put some um, pressure on the owner to um, uh, sort of bear the risk of, of, of that, that design. So um, some shared risk might be in a design build approach um, and even uh, more shared risk in a design build um, uh, operate or design build own sort of interchangeable there and then the design build finance own um, which we see it's usually larger scale let's say you know 100,000 gallons a day give or take um, you really see the um, there's a there's a market there for folks that will finance these systems. Excuse me. 
I did go through a project recently where we did a whole RFP for a, a finance system at the end of the day um, that the cost for that financing, for passing that financing on to the tenants was not something that the developer thought would be viable. So they decided to go back to just a design build approach. So something to consider is that when you're financing a system that that financing is, there's a, there's a cost to that money. So um, thinking about how your whole pro forma fits together in terms of how you're going to uh, fund fund your water reuse system. Okay, quickly I will touch on water balance. We'll do this sort of three-step approach, um, um, maybe not in any particular order. But um, so water balance is just looking at the, the water resources on your site. So you might see in some green building standards, this is taken from the Living Futures framework. Um, a water balance can really just be done from a natural system standpoint, right? We get rain, we, you know, runs off, there's infiltration, there's groundwater. There is a natural hydrologic cycle that should be taken into consideration for any given site. Um, often for urban properties, we're talking more about, you know, water supply and wastewater management. And so you get very quickly into more, much more complex water balance analysis where you're looking at seasonal changes in demands, you know, how are we going to um, meet rigorous sustainability goals. This particular diagram was from a project that will be uh, net zero water by exporting recycled water to an adjacent site. Um, so that's um, a very ambitious goal. We see that sort of terminology popping up in, in these green building standards more and more. Um, you know, you may just look at annual water balance. But simple, let's, let's see what our supplies are, see what our demands are. And, in this particular case, we, we made up some sort of supply gap to get to that net zero by um, by mining some some water from a site, a sanitary sewer that came through the site. So being opportunistic here on the water balance standpoint. And it's something to consider the industry called peaking factors. Um, it was mentioned about a building being unoccupied for you know part of the year or um, a building being um, you know maybe more occupied during certain events or things like that. So something to really consider about water systems is what is my peaking factor when, you know, it's driven by occupancy, and you'll see in the next series of slides, um, I'll walk through that, um, but it, 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 has to, it has a big impact on how you design that system. So I'll sort of leave it there, and happy to answer questions on water balance later. For um, some water characterization, I really want to get into this. I think it's a under, just say understudied <laughs> um, part of the design process. Um, I guess I will argue that you know, water quality engineers such as myself are sort of a newer member of the design team and would encourage owners to, um, and developers to, to um, do a careful uh, characterization of the water supplies that they're looking at, whether it be rainwater, stormwater, gray water, full wastewater treatment, um, or any other alternate water source. Uh, condensate has come up a lot today. Um, a lot more humidity and condensate to, to gather here than out in California, um, but uh, certainly we want to understand the quality of that water that we're, um, we're going to be taking on, as well as the flows. So for, are we considering collecting the rain? Um, I'm glad other folks have clarified the difference between rainwater and stormwater. I think we all understand rainwater comes from a roof. Cars don't drive over surfaces that um, you know, could gather oil and grease and heavy metals and um, other, other things that stormwater do gather. Um, also considering, is it a naturalized watershed or an urbanized watershed? If your site's next to a highway, um, your darns are going to have really different uh, water quality than a site that's you know, tucked out in the forest, right? Um, so not all rain, uh, rainwater or not all runoff is treated the same. Um, so land type cover, proximity to airborne pollutants I mentioned, uh, type of vehicle traffic. Maybe you are collecting off of a hardscape, but cars aren't traveling on it, so you actually won't have a lot of pollutants on that uh, runoff. Um, source control of potential pollutants. So um, there was a project mentioned earlier today where the water was already going through a sand filter. That's great. Use the, use the landscape as your friend to improve your water quality. Use those landscape-based systems, sand filters, etc., cetera, um, and, and um, design a collection system that's doing part of the work for you. Um, so again, getting to the equipment specification is sort of the last part, the collection system is really um, where some of the magic happens. Um, and then just remember that these are event-driven systems when you're capturing rainwater and stormwater, um, much more so um, in California where the rain is less frequent, um, but you know, here the systems are going to go off and on very frequently, um, which is a lot different than, than let's say, a wastewater treatment system. So keep in mind that um, that there are some maintenance activities maybe related to the uh, event-driven nature of, 
of rainwater and stormwater reuse. Um, so I, taking the waste out of water, I have to give credit to um, one of the utilities out in California, Sacramento um, Sanitation, who came up with this term where I saw it recently, but I think it's a great way to think about um, sort of what we're going through now in terms of how we think about and, and manage our water resources. So um, some, some quick considerations. On the right is sort of your, your cheat sheet. If you know nothing about wastewater, but you kind of say, yeah, there's solids, organics, and pathogens, people will go like, oh, yeah, OK, you know a lot about wastewater. <laughs> so um, that I borrowed these from SFPUC has done a lot of great work just in um, sort of messaging around their program. <coughs> Um, so, so, so program, what, what type of activities are happening on your site? That's very important. Um, if you have kitchens, uh, that wastewater is going to be very different than a site that is, uh, you know, just office. So uh, keep in mind that those activities matter. Occupancy, so how many people, when are they there? Um, how, how long are they there every day? Um, are there times where there's not a lot of people there? Um, and, and I just call it dilution volume. So what kind of fixtures are you using? What are the flows for those fixtures? Um, all that water that you're using is really just diluting the other stuff in it, the solids, the organics, the pathogens. So it's, um, you can kind of think about it as, as a dilution volume. Do you have gray water? Do you have showers or not? Um, and um, what I'll get into later is if the load kind of stays the same, how much water are you diluting it with? Um, timing. When will the highest flows occur, the lowest flows? So these are all parts of the design that need to be considered. Um, and maybe at, like in a hospital, for example, you have special considerations around hazardous waste. Um, so flows, loads, equalization will come into play with those peaking factors. Water quality, what water quality do I need? And are there discharges, um, which will take, play a big part um, in, in your permit. So program is really uh, the flows and the loads. And uh, <laughs> I won't bore with this, this is just to say that in a project that I did, um, nitrogen was a big driving constituent. And um, we, we went through and we characterized that nitrogen content for each restroom type. This was a rest area project for the transportation department out in California, Caltrans. So, um, you know, really um, important to identify what constituents are important for your site. And this is uh, just a fun uh, sort of bubble diagram showing some of the activities that were happening in this, um, in, in, in this particular building. Um, and my favorite statement, unfortunately, Bedrooms do not generate wastewater, people do, right? So if you think about some of the ways in which water um, unit water demands are, are allocated by square foot or by hotel room, right? It doesn't really work when you're trying to understand wastewater quality. It's, it's the people, it's the users, it's the occupants that are going to determine that. But I do want to point out, it's not, you know, all this consideration is not totally new, right? This is actually a mechanical uh, daily schedule, hourly schedule, showing when there's going to be the most lighting, the most equipment is going to be used, the most people. We can kind of take that curve and use it to understand how much water is going to be used, when it's going to occur. So um, building off of some of the design work that's already being done on them and creating a whole new field. And this is just to point out that in uh, Cal Green had very, very low, very aggressive water fixture standards. Um, and a standard textbook will tell you this is how much wastewater per capita. So um, you can't really rely on the standard resources either. You really have to do the work, understand what's going to be um, happening in your building. So a potential unit demand factor of four times textbook compared to the current code. Um, textbook has to catch up, I guess. Um, we can pack a lot of more programming, um, and textbooks are still high in terms of unit flows. So. Um, and then unit load, so um, this is particular organic load. I mentioned this <coughs> solids, organics, pathogens. This is that organic load. And um, that differs based on whatever standard you're looking at. So um, you want to be considerate. Um, but at the end of the day, you can sort of build up this you know, model for uh, wastewater. You say, OK, I've got full-time equivalents. They're using this much water each. They're producing their on-site this long. And they're producing this much load. And then I get my water quality characterization. So, Pretty simple process, but um, really want to make sure you go through it. So we've done that a few times, and for each of these constituents, we found that we were, uh, you know, it's a small data set, but we found that we were actually um, pretty on target. But um, for the wastewater aficionados in the room, uh, uh, organic load above 700 is really high. <laughs> so um, understanding that these systems don't have the kind of dilution necessarily that a typical wastewater treatment plant might experience. Okay. Hopefully I'm not running too long here, but the, so the business case, um, which I want us to spend some time on, you know, we talk about making the business case, say, for solar panels, and, you know, maybe it's, maybe we have them, maybe we don't. You can't not have water infrastructure, right? So 
keeping in mind that it's a very essential part of the buildings. Um, so I would ask, you know, are investments required to support my development? Um, if so, what is the best type of investment? And, and I think probably most importantly from a development perspective, how can I gain confidence that these are the right commitments to water infrastructure that I'm making? There's a lot of options out there. Um, so, first of all, okay, maybe I've decided what the investment is, how am I going to pay for it, right? Um, so you can do something like a simple payback. Um, you know, we've seen paybacks in the range of, of, of 8 to 12 years coming back pretty regularly now. Um, and you'll see later even some shorter ones in, project, in places where water and sewer rates are quite high. Um, so keep in mind that, that business as usual, you know, has a cost. So make sure that we're comparing them, not zero to some big water reuse project, but some business as usual costs to a, a, a water reuse project. Um, assessing life cycle costs and what, how important they are for your development. Maybe you're an owner developer and they're very important. Maybe you're not and um, it's, it's less, you need a quicker payback. Um, and maybe there's some costs that can be recovered via a water purchase agreement, so that's more of that finance uh, type of model I mentioned earlier. Um, determine first cost offsets. So there was a uh, comment earlier today about um, not paying certain fees for your meter, downsizing your meter, really important, but capacity fee offsets. Articulating the less tangible benefits. Is there a community benefit that will help you get your project approved as this project that a water use system provides? Um, and review those, review those rates. Um, and keep moving here. So we recently did a, a case study in Atlanta, where, which does have some of the higher water and sewer rates. Uh, we were comparing an alternative of um, reuse for um, uh, basically, do we dual plumb or do we not uh, dual plumb the buildings? Do we pay for the cost of dual plumbing the buildings, or do we just use it for um, cooling and irrigation and other mechanical uses? And um, in both cases, we found that um, a, a fairly small scale, so this, is, this is that scale um, and, and rate escalation is being compared here. So um, over time on the bottom, we, or over um, uh, scale on the bottom, uh, we see that the, the volume used is that curve progressing and the combined sewer rates is that curve aggressing down there. And we can see that at a, a very uh, 25,000 gallons per day, fairly small system, um, I think depending on, on um, your perspective, the other system, I think, was 5,000 gallons a day that we saw the case study on, so um, a bit larger. Uh, but, but we start to see that we're um, already making gains on the what you would pay just per gallon for water and sewer rates. So this was intended to be a fairly simple uh, graph to understand, but happy to go through it more later. And comparing those two alternatives, we found that in either case, you're looking at like a, less than a five-year payback. Um, so this is really a case where it made a lot, a lot of sense. Um, so I'll quickly go through some design solutions. Um, so going back to rainwater and stormwater, I just want to point out that there are often opportunities, and there was a great project this morning where sort of found a, a rainwater cistern right at the Austin Library. Um, that is an, a, a great opportunity to save costs on, on volume storage. This is a project we um, did the stormwater design for um, New York City. That was a whole um, decked development over a rail yard. And that we were able to build water storage into that built up deck system um, to provide uh, irrigation water. So um, that was a really great integrated design opportunity. Um, you know, not um, no need to have sort of like tanks segregated and things like that. Um, and this is a great project that's um, under construction now uh, for Google in Mountain View, where we're able to find also uh, convenient places to store water. So you'll see at the bottom there we had uh, 720,000 gallons of storage, um, which is quite a lot of volume. And um, I'm going to skip through these. And that's all located in the lower level or basement of this building. And this is a diagram showing how that water is stored in uh, one of the four corner cisterns. That space in the building was not occupiable. The roof was, it was too low, so that it was basically dead space. So we were able to just kind of build two walls in each corner to create massive amounts of storage at a very low cost. <clears throat> so um, you know, it doesn't have to be a, an expensive um, you know, fiberglass, reinforced plastic buried tank, which you know, is a great solution. You'll see some here later. Um, but it can be something that's, if, if considered early on in the design, can um, really be uh, uh, a minimal incremental increased cost to find that storage volume. 
Um, and here's that project under construction now. I'm really excited to see it come online, working with uh, permitting agencies at the state level there. And this is another sort of design integration uh, project I'd like to point out. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a Sherwood project, but um, it's located in Atlanta. It's the Emily Warner Cup. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Um, but sort of say, find the wastewater treatment plant, right? We have all these centralized facilities that are being hemmed in on, and they're stinky and unattractive. And, you know, <laughs> this, these wastewater treatment plants are, are right here in the middle of this campus. And, you, you know, you think that they're a nice landscape amenity. Um, I didn't bring any more pictures, but if you, you know, go online, you'll see it's a really beautiful building with plants, kind of a, um, also by the sustainable water folks who are part of the project that Ryan Huffington is working on here. Um, so this is a, a Sherwood project here. It's the Microsoft campus, also in Silicon Valley, California. Um, and they were expanding. So it's actually a retrofit project with a major rebuild of five buildings to make this campus. Um, the site area is 15 acres. Four of that is green roof. Um, so they're really kind of trying to make a park-like setting here. Um, it's next to a creek, and um, stormwater management was uh, an imperative, and they also had very lofty sustainability goals and wanted to be um, net zero or as close to net zero water as they could, so we came up with this term net zero non-potable, which um, we've seen a lot of today, right? Let's not use potable water where non-potable is sufficient. Um, and even though they were increasing the number of employees on this campus through this build out, we were able to increase the, or sorry, decrease the potable water use reduction by 55%, um, which equated to about 4 million uh, gallons per year. Uh, and I'll just point out that because the project is going for um, these lofty sustainability goals through the Living Building Challenge, um, we worked on a seasonal basis to balance the water on this site. So we're actually reusing as much of that wastewater as we can during the um, uh, all parts of the year on sites to uh, keep that garden-like setting lush and green. So I'll just flip through quickly here. So from a recent site visit, the system will be installed. There's some tanks will be installed along the garage there. You see the pores going in and, and uh, the concrete pores and then um, some of the spaces where it'll be uh, this is going to be located in the garage. These are the, the storage tanks that help balance those flows year to year. This is a popular water use system from a vendor in Oregon called Aranko, and it's a um, very robust system, does a great job at um, functioning when there's variable loads. So these guys have been around for a while, and um, we'll be using some of their Advantex units on site. And then we also have an on site um, treatment wetland to help remove nitrogen. So all in all, it'll be a very visible project, and I just wanted to point out one last project we did, which um, I did a prior to Sherwood as a, as a researcher at University of California Davis, where we looked at a whole closed loop system for a rest area. And a lot of that research did go into the, the final report there for the risk space framework. So um, closed loop systems are, are possible, um, but we have some very high strength wastewater and there's some special considerations there. So happy to talk to any folks about that. Um, so, Touching on some of the themes we had, on-site non potable water systems are a transformative opportunity. Engage in an engineering assessment early and um, get, get an informed decision on, on the type of system that you, you think is best for your site. Consider all the driving forces, so I'll just urge you to think about water supply characterization. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there are some, hopefully some of you agree, there's changing market forces or changing drivers. Um, and so uh, selecting that right project appropriate delivery and, and business case assessment um, is, is um, paramount. So thank you all and um, I think we're ready for that. <laughs>